All right, 2 Corinthians chapters 1, 2, and 3, he already was talking about how that God is the God of all comfort. And he was saying that he was comforted by the fact that the Corinthians were edified and built up and given life through the ministry of the Apostle Paul. And in chapter 2, he said, I didn't come to you because I didn't want to be a burden or heavy on you. I didn't want to make you sorry. And he talks about how that he has success pretty much everywhere he goes preaching the gospel. And then in chapter 3, he talks about how his ministry, which he ministered to the Corinthians, is better than the ministry of any other false preachers or teachers who are out there. The Corinthians had false teachers among them. And in 2 Corinthians, Paul is defending his ministry to those saints. And if you have any doubts about whether or not the Apostle Paul's ministry is effectual for you, 2 Corinthians is a great defense of Paul's ministry to anybody. And right here in chapter 4, he is defending the ministry he has received. He says, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. You say, what ministry is he talking about? Well, later in chapter five, he calls it the ministry of reconciliation. What is the ministry Paul is talking about here? In chapter three, if you notice here, he says, therefore, in chapter four, verse one, so you're going to look back to chapter three to see what he's talking about, to see what it's there for. Chapter 3, what ministry is he talking about? Well, he said that they were the epistle of Christ ministered by us. So Paul was ministering literally Christ to the Corinthians. What else was he a minister of? God hath made them able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the what? Spirit. We learned in chapter 3 that the ministry of the Apostle Paul is to give the Spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ of the New Testament into the heart of men, that it is written in uh, fleshy tables of the heart. He calls it in verse 8, the ministration of the Spirit. There in verse 9, the ministration of righteousness. And I want you to remember that, that as you are receiving the ministry of the Apostle Paul, the ministry of the New Testament, which is not Paul's ministry, it's Christ's ministry, ministered through Paul, You're not just learning head knowledge. You're not just to have a better head understanding of the Bible or be able to answer somebody's questions here or there or be puffed up with some knowledge. The ministry of the Apostle Paul ministers the Spirit of God into your heart and adds righteousness to you as a person. Adds righteousness to your very soul. And it makes you more prepared for the judgment seat of Christ through that righteousness. Can you guess whose righteousness that is, by the way? It's not mine. It's not the righteousness we'll see, not of the law, but that which is through the faith of Jesus Christ. There is a righteousness that you earn after salvation through this ministry. And it's not by works, it's by faith. Now, that is the ministry he has received. In chapter 3, verse 18, he said, We all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. It's the ministration of the Spirit that he is talking about. In Galatians 3, verses 2 through 5, he's talking about this same ministration of the Spirit. Because some people really don't like the idea that you can receive the Spirit anymore after salvation. Well, he very clearly describes it in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 that the Spirit of the Lord is being written on your heart through that ministry. And if you read the context of what we're studying in chapters 2, 3, 4, and 5, this is a ministry you can reject. You can trust in Christ, be saved, and totally ignore the ministry of the Spirit in your life. And you will miss out on not ever having the Holy Spirit. You'll have the Holy Spirit of God, but you won't have received the righteousness He wants to add to you. You won't receive the life that he wants to add into your life and you won't have glory for eternity as a reward for uh, proving what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. In Galatians 3, he talks about this same ministry. He says, this only would I learn of you. Received ye the spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? And everybody in Christ can say, I received the spirit by the hearing of faith. Amen. 
I didn't get the Spirit of God by the works of the law. The people he's talking to have already received the Spirit, right? Paul is assuming that. Then he says, are ye so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? So you begin in the Spirit, and notice that word, begin. The moment you trust in Christ, you're just beginning in the Spirit. And then from there, what you want to be is made perfect. And you cannot be made perfect by the flesh. He says, have ye suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain? He therefore that ministereth to you, what? These are people who had already received the Spirit, who had the Spirit ministered to them. He therefore that ministereth continually the Spirit and worketh miracles. That's something he was continually doing in these Galatians among you. Doeth he it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? So there it is in Galatians 3, a second witness in the mouth of two or three witnesses. Shall every word be established? In 2 Corinthians, he makes it clear, you've got to receive more of the Holy Spirit of God after you get saved. Right here, you have to have the Spirit ministered to you after you've already received Him. You say, how? By the hearing of faith. In 2 Corinthians 3, he said, you've got to look at this like a mirror and you'll be changed into the same image from glory to glory. Here, it's by the hearing of faith. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by? You cannot get the Spirit of God apart from the Word of God. You can't do it by the works of your flesh. And the warning of 2 Corinthians is that there are dire and eternal consequences if you do not receive this ministry of the Spirit. It's a big deal. He said in verse 1 of chapter 4, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. Well, why... Was it, why would it matter if they faint not? If you just receive all the Spirit and you're made perfect right away, why would Paul faint not? He could have just quit. No, he says, But have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the Word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Paul is going to show that it's very important as a minister of Jesus Christ, his duty was to minister in truth and in honesty and in sincerity, as opposed to ministers who walk in craftiness and handle the word of God deceitfully. And there's a whole lot of references to help out with that. In 2 Corinthians 1.12, he said, For our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we have had our conversation in the world, and more abundantly, to you word. A point he's going to make to us is that when he went to preach the gospel to the Corinthians, it was with nothing but sincerity and honesty, and he was showing them, look at what Christ has done in me. I don't have to hide anything from you. I can be totally honest. I can be totally open with you because I have nothing to hide. There are ministers who are going to do things with craftiness and with deceit, but not me. And that power, the work of Jesus Christ in Paul's life, was a proof that his ministry was legitimate and powerful. And it's by the manifestation of the truth that he commended himself to every man's conscience. So, what, is, what in the world does that mean? <laughs> I know that's confusing the first like 15 times you read it. What does that mean? When the Corinthians were to sit down and think, well, who's right here? Is it these false ministers that Paul is calling false, or is Paul right? Paul is saying, think of how I came to you. When you watched me live among you, the manifestation of the truth is how I showed you the gospel. I, I lived totally open with you, and did you see anything you didn't like? Did you see anything dark, wicked, ugly, evil, hateful? No. Check your conscience. What did your conscience say about the Apostle Paul? He's appealing to them to look at his behavior in his life, same as he did in this cross-reference here, talking about his conversation. In chapter 2, 17, he said, We are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. 
a couple more references here. Ephesians 4, 14 and 15. He says that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. How? By the slight of men. That's sneakiness right there. Somebody doing an underhanded, crafty, uh, beguiling deal. By the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love. See the same thing right there as you do in 2 Corinthians 4. That he's saying, we just live openly and honestly. There are ministers who are going to try to deceive you through craftiness and through slight of men, but instead, we just speak the truth in love. May grow up into him in all things, which is the head. In 1 Thessalonians 2, he says, For yourselves, brethren, know our entrance in unto you, that it was not in vain, but even after that we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as ye know at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. Each of these examples I'm showing you is when Paul showed up to these churches for the first time, when he showed up to the city, he's telling them, I was honest and open and I suffered and I dealt with you in honesty and in sincerity and in a good conscience. You need to beware of people who don't deal that way with you. Beware of ministers who are not walking honestly among you, who say to do one thing and then they themselves do another. That's not simplicity. He spoke unto them the gospel of God with much contention. He said, For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor in guile. But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel... Even so, we speak, not as pleasing men, but God which trieth our hearts. For neither at any time used we flattering words, as ye know, nor a cloak of covetousness. God is witness. What I want you to see from this verse is that he said, We have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness. That tells me that a minister who's walking in craftiness has not renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. And as a minister, pastor, who is our bishop, I've been saying that word, I've been trying to bring that word into my vocabulary because I like Bible words. I know pastor is a Bible word, but bishop's a, can I say more Bible word? (laughs) He that desireth the office of a bishop desireth a good work. That's not a Catholic word, it's a King James Bible word. And uh, pastor, as a minister, Obviously, I I believe our pastor with all my heart has renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. I trust his conscience. He's walked honestly among us. I hope that I do the same. And we ought to, every one of us as ministers, you're a minister to your family, you're a minister to the lost people you come in contact with, you ought to have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. You cannot minister to somebody the life of Christ if all you have is death working in you, walking in sin, walking just totally dominated, by the world, totally dominated by your flesh. If you try to do that, you will be walking in craftiness, handling the word of God deceitfully. You say, how's that? Because there's no way you can honestly preach the gospel to somebody if you don't know the life of Christ in you. So it's by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. He was commending himself and the people with him. Look at us. When Paul showed up to the city, he was literally saying, look at what Christ has done in me, who was before a blasphemer, injurious, persecuting the church, wicked, hateful. He was exhorting them to look at Christ's power in me. And that's a crazy thing to say. I mean, when when I preach the gospel, off the top of my head, I want to say, don't look at me, look at Christ. But Paul is saying, when you minister, you in yourself, Better show the Lord Jesus Christ. You all, you've always heard that saying, your walk talks louder than your talk talks. If somebody comes in and says, Jesus Christ wants to offer you life, and then you see them smoking meth and doing all kinds of wickedness behind the scenes, well, you don't want to believe that guy for one second. That guy's not a minister ministering honestly. You ought to be able to commend yourself, not your flesh or your ability, but Christ in you, the life of Christ in you. And I'll show that here in a minute, that that's very clear. He said, "For uh, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. And right there, if you notice, commending ourselves to every man, the next, our gospel. He's making it very personal, not just the gospel, but our gospel. It is hid to them that are 
lost. He said in 1 Thessalonians 1, 5 there, For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power. You say, how's that? Well, the power of the gospel had already worked in Paul's life, and that same power began to work in the life of the Thessalonians. Somebody can show up to a city and start preaching the gospel and say a missionary goes to Peru. You know, I'm, I'm not, well, let me use a different country because let's say you go to Pakistan and there's a city of heathens who don't know the Lord and you preach the gospel to them and they all trust in Christ. And then you're in that city robbing, lying, and stealing. And the Christians who get saved there continue robbing and stealing and lying. That's the word of God in word. That's the gospel came in word, but it didn't come in power. The power of the gospel is real. It should change you and it should change the lives of the people that it's ministered to. And Corinth is the example here of what should not happen. They got saved and then they started living wickedly. They assumed that they should continue in sin, that grace may abound. And the example of Corinth should exhort us, do not just talk. Thessalonians right here. Paul didn't show up and just talk about the gospel. It was powerful in his life and it was powerful in their lives. The Thessalonians changed very quickly. The, uh, the Thessalonian epistles were written really shortly after they were saved and they were already perfected in Christ. They had grown up really fast. It says, also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance, as you know what manner of men we were among you. You say, what is he talking about when he says that the gospel came not in word only, but also in power? For the power, he says, look at what manner of men we were. Look at the power that the gospel has had in our lives and how we lived among you. That's the power of the gospel. And you, as a minister, are walking deceitfully and craftily if you don't have the power of the gospel working in your life. We ought to receive that power and be changed and then minister to others. 2 Corinthians 4.3, it says, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. And I believe that's anybody who's not inside of Christ, but in the context of the last chapter, he was talking about a specific set of lost people. Um, Jesus Christ, in his uh, ministry on the earth, used that word lost. By the way, it, the Bible, as far as I can see, that's the only time where it says lost, talking about like lost people versus saved people. The lost throughout the Gospels is where he says the lost sheep of the house of Israel. At least three different times Christ talked about them. In 1 Peter 2.25, he says, For ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. So you say, who are these lost? Well, the lost are people, according to the next verse, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. And in chapter 3, he said that those people were, it's in verse 13, not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. So in context, the lost there is the lost Jews. Uh, the children of Israel there is who he's talking about. And he says that the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Who's the God of this world? That's a quick, good, accurate, easy answer. Amen. Satan's the God of this world. Jesus called him the prince of this world, or Peter did. I know Jesus did too. Peter also said it. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. That reference is wrong. I don't know what it is. It, I think it's in John 10 or 14. Somewhere in there, but that's a wrong reference. But Jesus does say in the Gospels, the prince of this world would be cast out. In Ephesians 2, 2, he calls him the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. There are some people who don't believe in the devil. And the God of this world is real. God, Jesus called him the prince of this world. Paul called him the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh and the children of disobedience. And I want you to notice something important about Satan that he's trying to tell you here. First of all, the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. They can't see the gospel of Jesus Christ because their minds are blinded. You say, what is Satan up to these days? What is he doing? What is he uh, busy doing? This prince of the world that 
now worketh in the children of disobedience has something called the course of this world. You know what a course is? It's like a path. Uh, if you're in school, your course is like your curriculum. If you're on a racetrack, your course is the track that you're following. It's a direction that you are to go. And the God of this world has a course called the course of this world. Say, why in the world does every lost person think the same? Why are they all so deranged in the same way? Why does every person on the planet, despite all common sense, believe that this earth is billions of years old? How in the world can most, well, because that's the course of this world. And they are of their father the devil, and the lust of their father they will do, including think the things he wants them to think. He's a liar from the beginning, a murderer from the beginning. He's a liar and the father of it. The people of this world all think the same way because it's the same spirit guiding them in the same course. And the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. That tells you right there, Satan is not busy just down in hell. He is loose. <laughs> uh, he is active. I believe just like in Job, I think he's still going to and fro in this earth. And he's not going to be bound until the end of the tribulation. So right now he is loose, he is free, and he's not operating, you know, some people say, oh, Satan got a hold of me today. I, maybe, because Satan's got a whole lot of power. He's got enough power where he has a grip on every mind of every lost person in the world. Specifically, the lost Jews that he's talking about here who didn't believe in Christ. People say, how in the world could you see the Messiah with your eyeballs and still reject him? Because... The people who saw him were of their father, the devil, and he had their minds blinded. He blinded the minds of them which believe not. And that's who he's talking about there in 2 Corinthians 3, 13 and 14. The children of Israel, their minds were blinded. Why does he have to blind their minds? Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. If Satan didn't have their minds blinded, I believe that Jesus Christ... The Bible, Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, I believe it's such a bright and glorious light that everybody would have gotten saved like that. Satan had to have a plan in place. He had to have their minds blinded so they couldn't receive the Messiah. And something interesting is that Satan is the prince of the power of the air. We just read that, right? He is the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. He is the God of this world, little g. We think of him as evil, wicked, but remember, I mean, he's the head of this evil network of principalities and spiritual wickedness in high places, right? Satan, as far as I can tell, is the head honcho of that army of devils. Amen? Where does Satan get his authority? There is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. You say, Satan is ordained of God? Yep. It goes, God... Jesus Christ, head of all principality and power, us in Christ, Satan, as far as I can tell. I mean, he's up there, way up there. And that's a hard thing to wrap your mind around, but remember this, Satan blinded their minds because God wanted him to. You remember the prophet Isaiah said, I want you to blind them, give them eyes that they cannot see, ears that they cannot hear, and uh, lest their heart be converted. Jesus said the same thing, and Matthew quoted that passage and said, Jesus spoke to them in parables so that they would be blinded and so that they would stumble and fall. Why? Because their hearts weren't right. Even the God of this world, when he blinds the minds <laughs> of the lost, is operating according to God's will and under God's authority. It's really incredible. You, you can't really, a lot of people say Satan is the greatest imitator of God. Absolutely, but you've got to remember God is doing a lot of things through Satan. It said in Hebrews that, or it said in another place that if they had known God's plan for the church, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory, right? They didn't know what God was going to do through his death, burial, and resurrection. And in Hebrews, it says, through death, he might destroy him that had the power of death. But Satan, when he was making sure that Christ got killed on the cross, didn't know it, but God was using that to destroy Satan. He, uh, it says in 1 Corinthians 2, he taketh the wise in their own craftiness. I mean, at every single step, Satan thinks I'm going to get an advantage over God and God is 50 million steps ahead and defeats him at every turn. 
He has already written the end of the story and told you how he's going to defeat Satan with every detail. <laughs> and Satan's still going to try. It's absolutely amazing. So you've got to remember, God is behind the minds being blinded by the God of this world. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, or, yeah, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Jesus Christ is the image of God. You and I were born in the image of Adam, just like Seth. Adam was made in the image of God. Uh, God reminds Noah of that in ch chapter 9 of Genesis. But in chapter 5 of Genesis, Seth is born in Adam's image. And you and I are born in the image of Adam, according to 1 Corinthians 15. But once we are saved and start receiving that ministry of the Spirit, we begin to be changed into the image of Jesus Christ. You say, why in the world is he talking about Satan blinding their minds lest they should see Jesus Christ? In this verse, he's talking about people looking at the Apostle Paul and seeing the Lord Jesus Christ in him and being saved because of it. He's defending his ministry based on his own behavior. And right here, he's talking about Christ who is the image of God. Hebrews 1.3 says that Christ is the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. Bing. Bright. In 2 Corinthians 3.18, it said, We all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory. In John 8.12, Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Daniel, what are you talking about? You and I who have received the gospel of Jesus Christ ought to have that light shining from us so that when people see us, they see the light of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ when they see us. And Christ is his brightness. Christ, you and I are changed into that same image. And Jesus promised, if you follow Jesus Christ, you won't walk in darkness, but you shall have the light of life. Now, you can choose not to follow after Christ, and guess what you'll have? Darkness. Matthew 6, 22, he said, the light of the body is the eye. What do you read the Bible with? The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, that means fully devoted with full attention, if thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, say, how can a Christian have an evil eye? You tell me. I can tell you how I've had an evil eye. Absolutely. We look at things we shouldn't. If thine eye be evil, comes off of this book and onto other things, thy, bo thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? So Satan's blinding their minds, lest that light of the glorious gospel should shine unto them. And a couple references here for that should shine unto them. What I'm trying to show you is that God's purpose for the church is to receive the light of Christ and shine that light on the world. And that's prophesied in Isaiah 60 verses 1 through 3. He says, Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. The glorious gospel of Christ, the light of the glorious gospel. See, shine, light, glory of the Lord. Where is the glory of the Lord risen? God is talking prophetically to a group of people who have the light and glory of the Lord upon them. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people. There's the God of this world blinding minds. But the Lord shall arise upon thee and his glory shall be seen. Where? Upon thee. The Apostle Paul is beseeching you to receive the light of the glory of Jesus Christ so that when people look at you, you can show Jesus Christ to them and they won't see you. And the Gentiles shall come to thy light and kings to the brightness of thy rising. Verse 5. This verse, unless you have that understanding of verses 1 through 4 that Paul is talking about Christ's light in them, this verse would make no sense. He says, for we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord. Because he just got done saying, look at me, look at my manner of life, my conversation, but we preach not ourselves. I'm not up here to tell you be like Daniel Cannon. Pastor's not here to tell you be like Brother Jason Cheek. Chris doesn't want to tell you to be like Chris Cohen. We're here to tell you be like Jesus Christ. Learn Jesus Christ. Receive the light of Jesus Christ. We're not preaching ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord. 
and look what Christ does in me. Ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. Paul, who he said is not behind the chiefest of the apostles, right? I mean, he's great in the eyes of the Lord. He has a high seat of authority in the body of Christ. And talking to Corinthians, the most carnal church who he called babes, he says, I'm your servant. That's what the light of Jesus Christ will do inside of a minister. It'll make you a servant to all men and not just a puffed up person who thinks you're better than everybody. And we've all seen examples of preachers who are like that. Um, and we do not want to be that way. John 12, 45. And he that seeth me, seeth him that sent me. Do you know who's saying that? Jesus Christ. When you looked at Jesus Christ in the flesh, you saw God the Father, right? Well, Christians... When people look at us, they ought to see the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what they ought to see. 2 Corinthians 4, 6. He said, For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And in that last verse of chapter 3, he said, We all with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, Right here, he uses that same word that we, or he gave in our hearts the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So that again tells you when you're looking at the scriptures, you are seeing the face of Jesus Christ and slowly you're going to be changed into that same image. And he calls that this treasure. He said, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. What's this treasure? That he has in earthen vessels. The light of the knowledge of the glory of God. He's staying on subject here. That this is what I've received in myself. That other men see when they look at me. This treasure is what he has in earthen vessels. What is he talking about with this treasure? It's that knowledge. In Ephesians 3.8 he said. Unto me who am less than the least of all saints. Is this grace given. That I should preach among the Gentiles. The unsearchable treasure. Riches of Christ. Colossians 2, 3. In whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So what's the treasure he's talking about? The knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. Anybody know what he's talking about when he says an earthen vessel there? Our bodies. That the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. In just a few verses later, he's going to say, always bearing about in the body, the dying of the Lord Jesus. He says, our body, down at the bottom, he said, our mortal flesh, telling you that that earthen vessel he's talking about is our body. Why can he call our body an earthen vessel, a vessel of earth? Dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. The Lord God formed Adam out of the clay. Is that right? Did he say clay? Dust, dirt, dust of the earth. There we go. There's some passage somewhere else where it says clay, but dust is Genesis 2. Yeah, so that earthen vessel, why, is it, why does it matter? What, what is he saying here? That we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. When you see the power of God working in Paul's life, He's just, he said, I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. He's, they said his bodily presence is weak. When you looked at the Apostle Paul, you didn't go, wow, what a great body. We've talked about that before. He's saying, the fact that God has put that treasure of knowledge in this dirty, corrupt earthen vessel means that the power, the excellency of the power has to be of him, not of us. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Still, just like in chapter 1, chapter 2, he's talking about the persecutions and the trials that we go through, and he's saying God's power is manifest in us because we go through these hardships. And he said these hardships, we are troubled, perplexed, persecuted, cast down, but we are not, in the midst of those things, distressed, in despair, forsaken, or destroyed. Whew, that encourages me. The lost world, when you look at them, you're going to see people who have trouble and are distressed by it. Perplexion and are in despair about it. 
persecution and are forsaken in the midst of their persecution, people who are cast down and destroyed. A Christian, and we'll look at this later, but all that are in God, yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Christians get persecuted if they're going to live like Christians. And you're going to see troubled, perplexed, persecuted, and cast down. That is the picture of the Apostle Paul in the middle of his Christly ministry. If you look at ministers and you see rich, reigning as kings, doing great, not a problem in the world, absolutely fantastic, nothing going wrong, you ought to worry a little bit. You ought to look into what is going on here because that's what Paul said the Corinthians were doing in 1 Corinthians, that ye have reigned as kings without us. You know, they, he, he was saying they were doing just fine. They didn't have any troubles. A real Christian who's in the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, living godly in Christ Jesus, is going to look like this. Troubled, perplexed, persecuted, and cast down. And that's a wonderful thing. Because then the power of God can be manifest in that person's mortal flesh. Because God doesn't allow them to be distressed, despair, forsaken, or destroyed. He says, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. Say, so Why in the world does God want us to bear his dying? Do you know what the dying of the Lord Jesus did for Christ? Why did he have to suffer? According to the book of Hebrews, yet learned he obedience through suffering, right? How are you and I going to learn obedience any other way? If Christ had to suffer, why should you get to learn obedience and learn righteousness without suffering? Why should you get to be made perfect without having to be punished by the world and have your flesh put through the ringer just like Christ? Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. I don't know about you, but I feel the dying of the Lord Jesus in my body quite often. Some people in the body of Christ have it more than others. Uh, I feel it a good bit. Not just the, I'm not talking about the challenges of dealing with the flesh. I'm talking about the fact that I'm trying to live godly in Christ Jesus means that my body has to endure some hardship in this life. That the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. You say, how is that? If I'm dying and I'm bearing his dying in my body, how does his life get manifest in my body? Because of the way you endure the suffering. He said, he's going to tell us later in chapter 12, most gladly, therefore, will I gr rather glory in mine infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Uh, Christ told him, my strength is made perfect in weakness. What did he say? What's the whole quote there? Yeah. He's, Christ said something a little more than, let me find that. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. He said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in mine infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. If you are physically strong and have no problems at all with your body, you don't need Christ's power. You're doing fine. But Christ wanted to teach the Apostle Paul, hey, I'm gonna, I believe he took away his eyesight for a little bit, and then he had a hard time with eyesight for the rest of his life. Paul besought the Lord thrice about that thing, and God said, my strength is made perfect in weakness. And Paul, instead of continuing to pray to have it removed, realized God is using this to perfect me and prepare me for eternal glory, so I'm going to rejoice in this thing and glory in this infirmity. And you ought to look at your infirmities and hardships the same way. God will give you grace to do it. The hard things we're going through are to perfect us and prepare us for eternal glory. And God has given you the spirit to help you go through those things. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. Once again, I told you Christians should look like that. Here's something else Christians should look like. Dying in their body. The sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. He said, we had the sentence of death in ourselves. In Romans 8, he says, if so be that we suffer with him, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time, the Christian life should not be happiness, sunshine, and rainbows, and fantastic all the time. It ought to be a hard, challenging thing. Jesus Christ himself said, if any man will follow me, let him take up, deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. He's given you a picture there. Jesus Christ took up his own cross 
and bore it until he literally couldn't anymore, and then somebody else had to carry it for him the rest of the way up the hill. Does that sound like a wonderful, happy, easy life? No, he was telling us, it's going to be hard. Take my yoke upon you, he said. 2 Corinthians 13, 4, For though he was crucified through weakness, yet he liveth by the power of God. That right there, talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, which by the way, he's in the conclusion of 2 Corinthians, letting you know the hardships that you are going through, Christ went through worse. He got crucified through weakness. And what did that do for Christ? He liveth by the power of God because he submitted himself to that crucifixion through weakness. And if you as a Christian will submit yourself to the suffering that God wants you to go through and go through it with him and receive the comfort and consolation he wants to give you, guess what you get? Life by the power of God. That's exactly what Paul's talking about in chapter 4. For we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God toward you. (coughs) Just by the wording of that verse, I know that that live with him is not talking about a future resurrection of the body. Live with him by the power of God toward you. That is the life of Jesus Christ manifest now. So that when people look at us, they can see the life of Christ in the midst of hardship. And they can see the light of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 4.13, But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when His glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Is that right? Absolutely. If you want to live godly, notice that word godly in Christ Jesus, here's what's going to come. Persecution. And that's what Paul's talking about. And here in 1 Timothy 4.8, a famous passage, For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life which now is, and of that which is to come. Godliness has promise of life now. But... It's going to come with persecution and no other way. Godliness has to be through persecution. And if you want that promise of the life which is now, look, you can live in death as a Christian as long as you want. And you will be ashamed at the judgment seat of Christ and you'll suffer loss. But if you want the promise of the life which is now, it is through godliness, which means you're going to have to go through persecution and suffering. 2 Corinthians will help you out with how to go through that. 1 John 2.25, and this is the promise that he hath promised us. Promise of the life which now is. You say, what's the life which now is? This is the promise that he hath promised us, even eternal life. There's a lot of Christians who look at all these passages about the life might be manifest in my mortal flesh, and they think it's just talking about in the future when we get resurrected from the dead. Paul is talking about the life of Christ being visible in your body now. And that eternal life that you got when you trusted in Christ, God didn't say, all right, you have eternal life and you don't get it until you're dead and then you get resurrected and then you can have eternal life. You have eternal life now. And God wants you to walk in that eternal life, raised to walk in newness of life. 4 verse 11, he said, for we which live. By the way, you've got to remember in this passage, we is Paul and the people he's with talking to the Corinthians who are you. And he's, when he says, we which live are always delivered unto death, he's not talking about the Corinthians, we all Christians, he's saying we, Paul. We which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be manifest in our mortal flesh. So then, death worketh in us. Who's that? Paul and his people, not you and me, not every Christian everywhere. Us is Paul the writer and the people he's writing with, which includes Timothy, but life in you. So how does that work? Because the death that Paul was delivered unto and the daily dying that he was going through meant that the life of Christ could be manifest in his flesh. So then the Corinthians, in them, life worked when they looked at the death that worked in the Apostle Paul. There's a picture for you and me, ministers, Christians in general. If you are going to live godly in Christ Jesus and be persecuted, one of the fruits of that thing is that 
The life of Christ manifest in your flesh is going to help other people and give them life. We're ministers of life, eternal life, not just preachers of the gospel. I'm saying Christians. It's our duty to minister that life unto others. And you cannot do that just by studying and knowing a whole bunch of things. It has to be by experience through tribulation. Verse 13, we, having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed and therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore speak. Right there, he's quoting Psalm 116 and verse 10. You can write that down. And Psalm 116, uh, after I saw this quote and went and looked at it, Psalm 116 is basically the same message as 2 Corinthians here. He said, I believed and therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore speak. What does Psalm 116 say that he's quoting there? I love the Lord because he hath heard my voice and my supplications. I was going to read this whole thing, but for sake of time, I just want to look at some highlights. This is David writing Psalm 116. The sorrows of death compassed me. Does that sound like Corinthians, what he's saying? The pains of hell got hold upon me. I found trouble and sorrow. That sounds like 2 Corinthians to me, just what Paul's talking about. He talks about how that the Lord is merciful. He called upon the name of the Lord. The Lord is merciful. God of comfort and the God of all mercies, he called him. The Father of all mercies in uh, 2 Corinthians 1. Here in verse 9, he said, I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. Death worketh in us, but life in you. And then here's the quote. I believed, therefore have I spoken. I was greatly afflicted. This is David saying that in the middle of my affliction and death and sorrow and trouble and anguish, I called unto the Lord. He heard me and gave me mercy. I believed in what he told me, and therefore I've spoken. Paul is doing the same exact thing. We, according to the same spirit of faith, the same spirit of faith that David had. Right now, I know if you just look at me, the Apostle Paul speaking, if you just look at me, you'd think, this is a nut job who gave up his life and a great career and now is suffering in his body for this fanatical belief he has. And he's saying, I have faith in what God told me. And because of that faith and that hope that I have that I'm looking forward to, I'm speaking these things to you, just like David did. <laughs> he said, I will take up the cup of salvation. In verse 14, I will pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of all his people. What was Paul teaching us? That in the middle of your persecution, if you call unto the Lord, receive the life of Christ, receive his power in the midst of your persecution, who gets benefited? All those people who are in your presence. They see the life of Christ in you. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Paul, David is literally talking about going into the presence of all the people and them seeing him die and God getting glory out of it. That is 2 Corinthians right there. Thou hast loosed my bonds down at the bottom. And then he praises the Lord there at the end. Verse 14. Knowing. So I believed and therefore have I spoken. Verse 14. Knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. There's two lives. Promise of the life which now is and of that which is to come. Right? Two lives. The one life is now and is already happening. It is a resurrection, raised to walk in newness of life. This right here is us being raised up by the Lord Jesus in the future. Raised up by Jesus and shall present us with you. This right here is Paul looking forward to a presentation. I'm going through all this suffering, bearing in my mind that someday I'm going to be raised up from the dead and shall be presented. Uh, shall present us with you. That Jesus Christ is going to present Paul and his people, the apostles, with the Corinthians. And we'll see it's not just the Corinthians. This is something that I wasn't taught about growing up, but there is more than just you and I individually standing before the judgment seat of Christ. There will be a time where those people who are the fruit of the apostle Paul's ministry will be presented with him. Paul is accountable for the people he ministered to. And we're going to see a few verses about this presentation. What is he talking about when he says that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to present Paul with the Corinthians? Who do you think Jesus is presenting Paul and the Corinthians to? His father. The church is the body of Christ. Is that right? 
It's His bride. And when there is a time for a presentation, Jesus Christ is going to give account for His church. Father, here is my body. Here is my bride. 2 Corinthians 11.2 For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. So right there, still talking to the Corinthians, he's saying, here's Corinth, and Paul, who is their minister, was going to take them and present Corinth to Christ. See that? That's something different than what he just talked about. What he just talked about was Paul and Corinth being presented by Christ to God the Father. There's an authority structure there. The, um, the head of every man is Christ. The head of the woman is the man. The head of Christ is God. And there's going to be a presentation where Paul presents his ministry to Christ, and then Christ presents his ministry to the Father. This presentation has to do with you being a chaste virgin or you being beguiled because you were tricked by Satan. Ephesians 5, 26 and 27, he says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. He already had the church, but then he wanted to sanctify and cleanse it. Why? Why does it need to be sanctified and cleansed? That he might present it to himself, a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. I think that right there adds another <laughs> presentation. Paul presents his ministry to Christ. Christ presents the whole thing to himself, and then I guess Christ presents it to the Father. We're going to see him presenting it to the Father later. Daniel, what are you talking about? This presentation is affected by whether or not you're sanctified and cleansed. The reason Paul is writing 2 Corinthians is to help these Corinthians be cleansed and prepared for that, preparate, for that presentation. Jesus Christ is doing the same thing to us through the Word of God. Colossians 1, 21, he said, And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death, why? To present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight, if ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled. What does that mean? He wants to present you holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight, but you can only be those things. You can only be holy, unblameable, and unreprovable if ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled. There's a reason Paul wrote to so many churches exhorting them, do not be turned away. I marvel that you are so soon removed from Him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Why did Paul care so much about these saints? Because there is a presentation coming, and if they are not wholly unblameable and unreprovable until then, it's going to be a bad presentation. He's going to say in the next chapter of 2 Corinthians, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord. In 1 Corinthians 3, he said that there was going to be a judgment seat, and at that judgment there was going to be fire. Every man's work shall be tried of what sort it is. If any man's work, suffer loss, his work shall be, or if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. It's a terrifying thing to be presented before the Lord. And the way that you live as a Christian, whether you receive the life of Christ or not, is affected by that thing. And who's our minister to help us with that presentation? Whereof I, Paul, am made a minister for that presentation. That's what the Apostle Paul. I didn't get this down in the notes, but in Acts 26. Paul said that when Christ met him on the road to Damascus, he told them, I want you to prepare the Gentiles. He chose Paul as a chosen vessel to get the Gentiles out of the power of Satan unto the power of God and to prepare them for an inheritance. That was Paul's duty as a minister. Colossians 1, 28 and 29, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom. Why? Why didn't he just preach the gospel and leave them be? that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence, presence, like being presented in his presence of the Lord Jesus Christ that is coming? For ye are our glory and joy. Look at 1 Thessalonians 3. To the end, he may establish your hearts, unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, 
at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. That right there tells you there's a time where Jesus Christ himself and all his saints are going to be presented before the Father. He talks about it right here. When he shall come to be glorified in his saints. In his saints. Jesus Christ will be glorified in his saints. In you, in me. And why does Paul care? Why does Jesus Christ care about you being sanctified and cleansed? Because he wants to be glorified in his saints. And all that glory is going to redound to the glory of God. But if you are not sanctified, clean, holy, pure, when that time comes, Christ doesn't get glory out of you. And neither does Paul. And neither do you. <clears throat> 2 Thessalonians 1.10, to be glorified in his saints. Verse 11, wherefore also we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling. Say, what calling? Being glorified, uh, being a cause of glory for Christ, and fulfill all the good pleasure of His goodness and the work of faith with power, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you, and you in Him, ye in Him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a big deal right there. You're going to be presented before the Father, and this ministry that Paul is talking about that he had received is to prepare you for that presentation. Verse 15, he said, For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might, through the thanksgiving of many, redound to the glory of God. If you receive this ministry, people will be able to thank God and give Him glory for that work in you. Um, I wanted to finish the chapter but I think I've got enough references here. We'll finish it in the next class. We'll stop there in verse 15.